Welcome to Our Town, a 30-minute podcast brought to you by Best Bark Communications, a small but fierce client-centered marketing company powered by decades of experience and well-established business networks. This is a special treat for Our Town and uh, and for a million of, of listeners to have the most famous announcer in the history of the President of the United States, <laughs> Charles Brotman, a native Washingtonian, grew up here, went to Tech High School, unfortunately moved to West Virginia at one time. At one time. And that's where he got started in broadcasting, as I recall. Correct. I went to the National yeah. Academy of Broadcasting. And graduated. And graduated. That's the... Uh, it, it doesn't exist anymore, but it was on 16th Street. I know it quite well. 16th and, uh, oh, like R Street. No, no, yes. higher than in, Park in that, Road. In that area. Charlie, but uh, did you get your first radio job in West Virginia? Runcevert, West Virginia. Wow. When I graduated, they said they'll get me a job. And at first, they said it was in Owasso, Michigan, in the wintertime. time. <laughs> And I told the, <laughs> the, ranger. the the people who were going to move me to Michigan, I said, basically, uh, I'm busy right now. <laughs> and so Call me. finally, when all my friends went back to school uh, in the summertime, now it was fall, and I had nothing to do, I said, I better see what's available. And what was available was Runcevert, West Virginia, and that was near the Hotel Grand, the, what was the name of that hotel? The, Bedford Springs? No. Something like that in West Virginia? No. West Virginia, Wheeling? Anyway. That that famous hotel. Greenbrier? Greenbrier, that's wow. it. Wow, that's yeah. a resort, that's fabulous. Yeah, so I would Did go- Did you live at the Greenbrier? Well, I used the Greenbrier, played golf there, <laughs> swam there, like I was a guest. And that's I, the best. <laughs> I inter interviewed the, goodness gracious, the Prince of Wales, is that possible? Yeah, he could have been visiting there. Yeah, Absolutely. He, uh, he was visiting the Greenbrier. Right. And I had a little microphone and tape recorder that I put right behind a plant. And I was interviewing the Prince of Wales. And he said that he had just gotten off the, uh, the golf course. He says, don't tell anybody, but I gave myself some gimmies I would never have made. <laughs> <laughs> like Bill Clinton. But, you know, he, the Prince of Wales was going to, was king of England for a while. That's And it. he abdicated. Uh, yep. But, and then he traveled. The, he married a, a woman from the state of Virginia. Yes. Wallace Simpson. Correct. We know all that, Charlie. And she we was a really lovely lady. I bet. Yeah. And it being the green bar. And that started you, and, and you've introduced... And I interviewed celebrities in their whole life now, whether it was in live radio or over a PA system. And then you came to Washington and said, I'm going to be in the PR business? Correct. How did that happen? Yeah. Basically, it all, everything has a beginning and end. <laughs> I hope the end isn't soon. But in any event, when I got into broadcasting... I uh, decided that I wanted really to get into sports. That was my thing. I wanted to be a sports announcer. So, uh -huh, we share that. Yeah. And so finally, when I went to Orlando, Florida, as an announcer at the WDB, whatever, in Orlando, Right outside of Orlando, like Silver Spring is to Washington, was Winter Park, Florida. And as the sports director, I'm in Winter Park interviewing all the Washington Senators ball players, And Calvin Griffith was there. The president of the team. He's the, the owner, owner right. of 
the Washington senators, and I interviewed him, and he says, Charlie, I understand that you're from Washington. I says, yes, sir. He says, well, we're looking for a new stadium announcer. And I says, wow, are you interested, Charlie? If, if I get this job, I will have thought I died and going to heaven. <laughs> I would love to have that job. He says, well, I got nine other guys who uh, next Wednesday are going to compete and we'll pick the best one. An audition. An audition. And Charlie, if you want, next Wednesday, just be there. I said, well, I'm ready. I'm a competitive guy. I'll be there. And so I got a plane and went to Washington, and I won the audition. Next thing I know, it's uh, opening day in Washington, 1956. I am introducing Yogi Berra, Mickey Mantle. I'm saying, <laughs> how did I ever get into this? This has got to be the luckiest thing ever happened. Died and going to heaven. Exactly. And then a friend of mine, Danny Bass, oh, another yeah. local guy. I'd been away from Washington for several years doing my thing on Learning radio. Business, Charlie. And I called Danny and says, Danny, you're a sports fan. You know the baseball guys. Why don't we do this? You'll be my spotter. Excellent. So we go. Uh, the announcing booth at Griffith Stadium was as high as you can go. It's on top the roof, of was the top of the roof. And uh, so we squeezed into the announcer's booth and I introduced Eisenhower throwing out the first ball and then I introduced the players on both squads. Now it's about the fifth inning. This is 1956. And we're losing again <laughs> by about a five to nothing. So the manager, Chuck Dressen, calls for a new pitcher, a relief pitcher. And I'm saying to Danny, okay, Danny, who is the new guy? So I'll be able to announce him. He says, I think it's Truman Clevenger. He's their best pitcher, but I'm not positive. I can't see the number. I said, that's close enough. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, now coming in to pitch for Washington, Truman he is telling me to cut it. Don't announce anything else. I don't believe it's him. <laughs> Meanwhile, Truman is still hanging out there. Well, he, he's giving you the cut sign. That's right. Don't say anything more about Truman because I'm not sure that's the pitcher coming in. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm looking down at Eisenhower, who is now looking up at me. What is this, a joke? Truman <laughs> is coming in to pitch for Washington. The guy I just defeated. <laughs> I can't believe this is happening. Is this some kind of a bad joke? <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm saying to myself, Charlie, this is your first and last game of all time. <laughs> and now the pitcher comes in, reaches down for the rosin bag. We can see the uh, number. Calvin Griffith would not have any names on uniforms because he thought it would cut down on program sales. <laughs> so we now see it, and sure enough, it's Truman Clevenger. So I kind of faked it a little bit, like technical difficulties. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, uh, Truman, Truman Clevenger, uh, now pitching for Washington. So I'm looking at the president now, and he seems relieved. <laughs> oh, there really is a ball player named Truman. I had no idea. 
I thought this was some kind of a joke. <laughs> so that was the end of uh, that day. The and first day. The first day. And, and it was the beginning of my announcing the inaugural parade. Right. That's what we want to go to. This is a, this is a handoff, Charlie. I, I tell you what happened. Uh, Let me set the scene for you. Yeah. Charlie has been the announcer for every inauguration since uh, Eisenhower. Right, D. Eisenhower. The second inauguration. Yeah, sir. You missed the first one. Yeah. Because he was serving his country in the United States Army. Navy. You, uh, Navy. You loved it, right? I loved it. Particularly in West Virginia. And now, and since then, and now he will soon be, we were told the other day, I hope he comes through, that you'll announce the next one of whoever the president is in January. If I live long enough, you will. yes. I'll see to that. Okay, thank you. You owe me money, and I don't want you to leave. <laughs> <laughs> so how would you get started? What happens now, it's 1956, the baseball season is over. It's November, and I get a call from a lady who says, are you Charlie Brotman? I said, yes, ma'am. Well, I'm calling from the White House. You, did you interview or introduce President Eisenhower? I says, yes, I did. Did you introduce him to the the ball players in, 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 in the clubhouse and the dugout? Yes, I did. Well, President Eisenhower got a big kick out of that, and you impressed him. <laughs> And we've been looking for you to see if you're still around and you'd be interested. The president wants to know, would you be interested in announcing him again? And I says, what an honor. Of course, I'd love it. Just tell me where and when and I'll be there. Well, the where is going to be on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C., the when will be January 20th, 1957. And I says, ma'am, I was born and raised in Washington. That sounds like the presidential inaugural parade. And she says, Mr. Brotman, you're absolutely right. <laughs> you will be the president's announcer. Gulp. I can't believe it. I don't know anybody. I'm not the, in the family. How right. did I ever even get involved in this thing? Well, it seems Eisenhower took a liking to you, Charlie. Right. When you introduced him Introducing to the all the players to him. And I said, well, I'd, I'd, I'd love to do it. And so January 20th, <clears throat> pardon me, 1956. Seven. Uh, 57, I was uh, on the roof of the media center, which is directly across from the presidential reviewing stand. The president, whomever it happens to be, has the worst vantage point. He is like almost level with the marcher. The, the, the street. Yeah. Can't see anything. And I was told, uh, Charlie, you are the president's announcer. He can't see who's coming, who's going, when, when to salute. I mean, he can't see anything because unless it's right on top of him. So as high as I am, I can see 15th Street to the left, 17th Street to the right. I'm directly across the street from the White House. And so everything went fine. And I, in my memory, it's like, well, it was fun. I did it. It's over. And that's the end of my announcing for the Capitol, the White House. Four years later, I get a call. Meanwhile, it's Kennedy coming in. Right, in 60? 60, 61. Yeah. And what happens, the woman who is calling me is saying, are you Charlie Brotman? Were you the announcer for... 
Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Well, we've never been involved with a parade before. We have no idea. <laughs> Where do we go? What do we do? Would you come to the White House so we can kind of pick your brain? And we would love for you to be the announcer again. And I'm saying, positively, I'll be there and we'll talk about it. Since that time, President Kennedy, President Johnson, President Nixon, President Ford, President Carter, Reagan, Bush, Clinton, Young Bush, and Obama. I have had the pleasure and the opportunity of meeting them all. I have uh, photographs taken with most of them. I don't know why you hate publicity. And uh, <laughs> I think you hate your right arm. It, it's a, a, a thrill, incredible, you know, Wonderful. being near and actively involved with the President of the United States, so, whomever he happens it's to be. It's a great story. It's a great story. I hope our, our audience appreciates it. We're talking to Charlie Brotman. Not only was the President's announcer, but he's my announcer, too. And we'll be right back after this message. We do have messages. Our Town with Andy Ockershausen. Are you retired or soon will be? Is your will up to date? Don't want to leave a mess for your family to clean up. I'm attorney Mike Collins, the guy who sends you those invitations to my estate planning seminar. I'll teach you how to save taxes, avoid probate, protect your heirs from lawsuits, bankruptcy, even the divorce court. Keep your money and your family with our innovative Reservoir Trust. Watch the mail for your invitation. Tuition's free when you register online at MikeCollins.com. That's MikeCollins.com. You're listening to Our Town. Brought to you by Best Bark Communications. We're talking with Charlie Brotman, the man who owns the presidency, and, and to my knowledge, never got paid. How does that stand, Charlie? As a matter of fact, every time that I was approached and asked about announcing the presidential inaugural parade, it would always come down to, uh, now look, we have a small budget <laughs> and we want you to be the announcer. We've heard that before. And uh, how much do you charge? And my reply for the last 60 years has been, there will be no charge. It's an honor. If I had to, I would pay you <laughs> to let me be the announcer. But I've never received one penny for That's being amazing story. Nature. I know that, Charlie. It, yeah. It's a great, it's a public service. It's something special. It's going to look good in your resume. Absolutely. What are you going to do? Wherever I happen to be. <laughs> <laughs> what happens, happens. Charlie, but you know, your, your familiarity with fighters, yeah. that is boxing, yes. promoting, you're a promoter, but, and you, you promote nobody better than you promote yourself. And um, you were a tennis, tennis announcer. I mean, you just have done so much, but... The people you have PR'd for are legendary in the sports world. For instance, Ray Leonard, the sugar man. Sugar Ray Leonard. <clears throat> when Ray was about 15, 16 years old, he was with the Golden Gloves, the AAU, and they had retained me to publicize these events. Right. In order to get publicity, I selected one of the fighters to be the next champion. Right. Like the poster boy for the fights. Exactly. And that person was Ray Leonard. And I didn't know he was going to be a champion. I didn't know that. He was just a kid. He was a kid. And he... Uh, was clean cut, he spoke well, and he was a really terrific boxer, even at the age of 15, 16, 17. Then in 19, 
Wouldn't it do? Was it 76? Montreal. Montreal. Sugar Ray Leonard won the gold medal in boxing. <clears throat> he and his entourage came back to Washington. I get a call from one of the fellas. Charlie Ray's back and I'm back. And uh, Jenks Morton was his name, one Jenks. of the trainers. But to be honest with you, Charlie, Ray is broke. We haven't made a penny on any of these things, and we need some help. Can we come to your office and talk about this? And I said, of course. Next day, they're at the office, Jenks and Sugar Ray. And... Uh, Ray, young man, handsome, debonair, lo looking now for guidance. What do I do? What should I do? How can I benefit from this gold medal? And and Charlie, I'd, I really would appreciate if you could help me on some of these things. And so I set him up with a several individuals doing some color commentating on boxing and on and on. He had indicated to me that I really don't want to be a boxer anymore. I want to go to Maryland University. I want to work with kids. And, and that's what I really would like to do. However, I know that my dad and my mom both have some illnesses that they're working with right now. I said, I'll tell you what, let's get for the next uh, couple of months, I'll, I'll see if you get some money coming in. I'll put you to work in different areas. He said, fine, let's do it. So I did that. Uh, three months later, it appeared that his father and mother were in a hospital and really needed money. And I'm telling Ray, like father to son, Ray, the only way you're going to make that kind of money is to box. Whether you like to box or not, this is what you're good at, and this is where you can make a lot of money. So sure enough, we changed his mind. Mayor of Baltimore, the mayor of Baltimore. It's William Donald Schaefer? That's it. Donald Schaefer called me and said, uh, you know that Ray was born in Maryland. I said, yes, sir. He said, we'd like for his first fight to be at the Civic Center in Baltimore. And I said, well, you're competing against Abe Poland and the uh, Capitol Center. I've been talking with them already, so the fee has to be considerably higher for him to move out of Washington to come to Baltimore. So we negotiated. Next thing I know, we're in Baltimore. <laughs> Normally, the first fight, this is traditional in boxing. First professional fight. First professional fight. The youngster normally gets $400. That's just oh. tradition and normal. We were able to negotiate with Baltimore for $40,000. Oh. Considerably higher. <laughs> and we worked with him the, the rest of uh, his 15-year career. Incredible it was job. a thrill, and a thrill for me. Here I am in Las Vegas, and I'm I'm kind of moving around trying to go. Uh, some of the entertainers I, uh, I wanted to meet, and they're saying, who are you? Get out of here. And that's where my famous line was, I'm with him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Yes. It worked. Come right in. Absolutely. I used to use it all the time. I'm with Brotman. You can't throw me out of here. <laughs> but, Charlie, Ray Leonard has been a, a sparkling example 
I remember the promotion you did for Riddick Bo. <laughs> who did did Riddick ever become champion? He did. That's what I thought. Yeah, the he was guy the from Fort heavyweight Washington. world boxing champion. Incredible, but Bo knows. I remember that promotion, and everybody had the pins on. Yeah, and so forth. we had him down at uh, Connecticut and K, where Duke Zebert was. I, everything. We had him skipping rope and <laughs> and, and, and shadow boxing and he, to promote meet, the fight. meet the next heavyweight champion of the world. We didn't know if he would be even beat his, his out of a paper bag. We didn't know, but he was, it worked. It worked. He came along. Yeah, and he and he was local too. Another local guy. We're talking with Charlie Brotman, who's a fountain of information. It's all true, and we'll be right back after this break. Hi, Tony Sybil here to tell everybody about our wonderful restaurants at Washington Harbor. Tony and Joe's, the best seafood in the city. Nick's Riverside Grill, wonderful chops and steaks. Wonderful views of the Kennedy Center, Roosevelt Island, the Roslyn Skyline. Spectacular. Two bars outside, right on the water. Fabulous food. For dinner reservations, call 202-944-4545. It's really a great experience. We'll see you down at Tony and Joe's or Nick's Riverside Grill. You're listening to Our Town with Andy Ockershausen. Brought to you by Best Bark Communications. Welcome back to Charlie Brotman. We're, we're chatting about his illustrious career, and we could be here for three days to talk about it. But uh, I'm reminded that you had, and I, I've seen it and been part of it, and, and Janice had, one of the most memorable, what call it, a recreation room in the history of Washington sports, Brotman's Lower Level. What yes. happened to Brotman's lower <laughs> level? For a long time, I'm a collector. Not a professional collector. It's just that I never threw anything away. And uh, I'm sure there's a lot of wives out there saying, just like my husband. <laughs> Junk. And uh, what had happened since I've been in sports a long time, I get souvenirs, uh, whether they be bats and balls, whether they be autographs. Uh, as a for instance, President uh, Nixon uh, w threw out the first ball, and I also entertained him by introducing him to all the baseball players, and it was on opening day. And I said, okay, Mr. Uh, President, uh, here's the ball you'll be throwing out. And he says, Charlie, I'm not going to throw out this ball. You've been so good to me. I want you to have this ball. And I'm going to write right now to Charlie, best wishes, Dick Nixon. <laughs> and I find out that that's a collector's item. Oh, my that God. He never signs his name Dick. But the thing was, he was macho. Right. He was right on the field. He was in the he dugout. He wanted to be one of the boys. And so I have that. I have... Uh, a rare, rare piece. I yeah. Mean. And the other that, that I what treasure is uh, Ted Williams. Uh, uh, to Charlie, your friend, oh. Ted Williams. Nothing better than and that. That's, yeah, I mean, those are things I know, that you... you... special, special thing. Well, Charlie, and we remember, we, the, yeah. those of us that, that knew Charlie Brotman, yeah. your office was covered, thousands of pictures <laughs> with sports celebrities, and your basement and your rec room... Yeah was covered with thousands of items, like you had stands from the original Griffith Stadium, right? Yes. Seats. Yes. Unheard of. The uh, presidential seats at Griffith Stadium, where the president sat and then would stand and throw out the first ball, unlike what they do now. Yeah, they get on the mound. They go on the mound, and, and so... When I think it was 1961 when they uh, tore Griffith Stadium down, and 
I was with the ball club at that time. Uh, Joe Burke and Ed Doherty. Remember those oh, guys? Those names. He's the general manager and business manager. And I'm the promotion and PR guy. And the announcer. And the announcer. And, and I go into their office and say, I got the greatest idea. They're tearing down Griffith Stadium. Why don't we have a Griffith Stadium at DC Stadium? Because they're throwing this stuff away. I thought, oh boy, th th these guys are going to love me for this wonderful idea. And he says, Charlie, that's the worst idea I've ever heard. We're not going to do it. We're just going to throw the stuff away. Who cares about this crap anyway? What? They weren't from Washington, and it was just junk to them. And I'm saying, there's thousands of fans here who would love to have anything you give them as a souvenir of Griffith Stadium. You got to be kidding. <laughs> Charlie, we're not going to do it. If you want anything in the ballpark, go out there, pick it up, just get the ground crew to take it home for you. But we're not giving, we're not having a Griffith Stadium Day. We're not giving and anything. That's, and that's selling anything either. So I immediately went down to the president's box seats, had the uh, friends of mine and the ground crew dig them up. It was four, four seats in a row. Had, had, uh, what? Yeah. And, Place uh, for your elbows. So and... I have him in my, my basement. And that's part of the memorabilia. Correct. Well, there's so many things. And and um, the question is asking me, where is it now? And my, I know where it is. Yeah. My daughter and her. Your wonderful daughter. And says, a wonderful girl, Charlie. Yeah. You're lucky to have her, baby. It's true. That's yeah, true. Her name is Debbie. Debbie Doxon. D-O-X-Z-O-N. <laughs> Great name. And they have a 10-acre farm, kind of a mini farm yeah and they got three barns on their 10 acres it takes 10 acres and three barns to house all my <laughs> junk uh but, these are really good good stuff and i find the photographs i must have a thousand photographs of every famous person in the world that ever I, I ever came in touch with, the the situation is personally I don't like to ask anybody for an autograph. I'm just a, not an autograph seeker. But for me, I do know almost all the photographers representing Absolutely. various that uh, was your job papers. Yeah, as a flat. And so I would say I'm going over. Uh, to Joe DiMaggio and give him something. Would you take a photo? That way I'm not bothering him. We're going to do this anyway. So now I have a picture of Joe DiMaggio, a Musial, I mean, all the superstars oh. of every sport. And I was president of the Touchdown Club and the Touchdown well, Club dinners. You're the only president of the Touchdown Club that I know of that had Bob Hope. Oh, that's State. right. Those were some days, Charlie. That's in the mid seventies too, and you had them on television, live. They, yeah. they te somebody had the great idea to to do the Touchdown Club presentation live on television. I wasn't in town, but I said, so yeah. "What the hell is Charlie Brotman doing with the press?" <laughs> what happened was, I thought that for our, I think it was nineteen seventy six. Correct. We needed somebody super. To be our MC, so I contacted Bob Hope, and actually went to Bob Hope's uh, agent, and the agent is saying, "You have to call. You got me in New York. I'm the New York agent. You need somebody from Hollywood. Here's his number." So I called Hollywood, and in each instance, they're saying, "How much are you going to pay him?" And I'm saying. We don't pay anything to anybody. 
this is for kids and charity. Charity. And uh, all the agents are saying, he'll never do it. He won't do it. Not for that. And it, I said, well, we'll give him a trophy also for helping us out. No, but, well, he's in Hong Kong right now, and he'll be back in, you know, a, a couple of weeks. Okay. Send us a letter, which I did. Then I followed up, and I said, after three months, it was like, no way. So I started asking other superstars. I get a call from his uh, agent that says, now this isn't, and this is not to say that he'll be there, but you got his interest. And uh, this is sports, and he loves sports. And uh, where will it be? How will he get there? And sure enough, I couldn't believe it. A, a week before the event, he's coming in. I met him at the airport, and I'm looking for at least 15, 20 people that would be traveling with him. An entourage. The entourage never appeared. <laughs> he came up the, 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 the walkway by himself, carrying an attache case. <laughs> I had to look twice to make sure it was him. Uh, Bob? Yeah, Charlie? Where are the rest of your gang? There's no gang, <laughs> no entourage. I travel by myself. <laughs> well, come on over. And so uh, I got to be friends. What a great them. thing. Now, at the time, he was the epitome of superstar. Correct. Bob Hope. Oh, that is exactly right. And you're the right. epitome of superstar now. Superstar PR guy, superstar announcer, superstar friend, and superstar grandfather, and superstar... Uh, you, you're sitting on a gold mine, Charlie, in that barn, and yeah. someday you'll get in and get something and give to me. A picture <laughs> of me. Uh, I, I've been talking to Mark Lerner. You want Mark to do is the, the son park. of Ted Lerner, who has the baseball team, the right. Washington Nationals, and also the uh, uh, Nationals Park. And he indicated that he might be, they're talking about possibly building a museum, right. and I'd love to have, Charlie, all your stuff in my museum. I said, that well, be we'll talk about it. So that's where we are. Don't hold your breath. Yes. <laughs> We've been listening to Charlie Brotman for a fabulous half hour plus about your career, which is still on the rise because you're going to do the inauguration of President whoever in yes. January. We're seeing to that. And that's going to be a special thing for all of us. And thank you again, Charlie Brotman. You've been listening to Our Town Season 1 with your host, Andy Ockershausen. New Our Town podcast episodes are released each Tuesday and Thursday. We welcome your comments and suggestions on how you like the show or who you'd like to hear from next. Catch us on Facebook at Our Town DC or visit our website at OurTownDC.com. Our special thanks to WMAL Radio in Washington, D.C. for hosting our podcasts.